Well, I think I'm going to be very dry. I've been also very North European about this and kept my slides to 15 and also not showing any of my work as was in the instructions. Yeah. Um, I wish I had brought some work now because I'm going to refer to things by implication which you won't see. So I just presume that, that uh, I'll, I may have even to verbally describe them since I didn't bring the slides. Anyway, um, this is going to be really about being a provincial, which may be an odd thing since I've lived in London nearly 50 years, but I still think there's a very interesting dynamic that emerges from how you think of yourself and how you spend probably the rest of your life fighting demons or fighting... You have a perspective on things which is still the perspective you had when you were 18 or so. I, I had this theory. I am a, was an army brat. That is an American term for the child of a soldier. And I can also say that I was a very late child. Uh, my father was in the First World War. Can you imagine something as historical as that? It's a very long time ago. He was underage. And he was very good at shooting Germans and winning medals. And after that, he went to India. And then he met a, a younger lady who was my mother. And by the time of the second... Remember, I was born in 1936. It, it surprises me, too. I don't think I'm that old, but it's, <laughs> technically it's what it says on my passport. And I was already a child, a little tiny child in the Second World War. Um, I would be pretending to say that I suffered. I did hear the sound of bombs, and I would leap into the bed with my parents when a nearby city was being heavily bombed. But, and I, we were dive-bombed when I was about three, but I didn't know about it. So most of the war time was spent in a city called Leicester. And, but my, I lived, in fact, in my youth and adolescence, probably in 10 or 11 different towns and went to 12 different schools. I was an army brat. We moved around and we moved around then. As we didn't need to move around, my mother, who was a neurotic, enjoyed moving around. And so we continued to move around. And the army brat, one of the first things I remember, going into English provincial hotels, which is where we seemed to hang out a lot, uh, were these etchings, these views of towns seen usually from a hypothetical hill near to the town. So we see, and they're called prospects. So we see the prospect of Norwich here, which is the most interesting town I lived in as a child. Uh, we see the prospect of Ipswich, which unfortunately is near Norwich and not very interesting. <laughs> and the uh, prospect, although the picture's prettier, um, and the prospect of Leicester, where I first became aware of the fact that my father, who by this time had managed not to be sent to the war, was in charge of pulling, of, of, of taking buildings for the military over a very large area. My first memories were of seeing these etchings sometimes and seeing his office, which was full of maps with pins in it. And I started to draw maps without the pins, and I started to draw prospects. I started to draw my own towns with churches and castles and so on. And then a funny thing, I, on a holiday, the first sort of seaside holiday, I started to see some, on the right there, some strange buildings that weren't old cathedrals and churches. Uh, albeit that as a small child, I'd insisted on dragging my parents to see the remains of Roman towns, which in England usually means a pile of stones in the corner of a field. Not very interesting, but I like a, like a, train, like a, like a train collector. I ticked them off uh, as, as this sort of uh, eager child to, be in, to, to find stuff. I think I'm a, what I call loosely, a, a, a word that doesn't exist in the, in the dictionary. I am a stuffist. I like stuff. One of the towns then that we moved to <coughs> was Leicester. And that was for about four and a half years, living in that town. And I have to explain that <coughs> both my parents were, came from poor families. They came from what is euphemistically called the working class. And I was, but by this time, my father was a colonel and had certain 
ability to take us to opera. And the, the city of Leicester was visited by a lot of symphony orchestras, opera companies, ballet companies. Uh, it was a place that they could escape to. And I went every week from the age of six to the age of ten and a half to symphony concerts. Every week we went to symphony concerts. So this enormous amount of orchestral repertoire uh, is sitting in my head. Um, and in fact, my favorite composer, both then and now, is Sibelius. I'm sorry, Spanish people. I don't go for Italian stuff. I don't go for Spanish stuff. I go for Finnish, which my wife, who's not English, says she feels is the British national composer, even though technically he was, was from, from, uh, from Finland. And the other thing is then, off, one of the last towns that I lived in for a substantial time, which was actually as long as six or seven years, that's a long time before I came to London, was Bournemouth, which again has a symphony orchestra, and where again I resumed, after some break, going to symphony concerts every week. Every week, every week, every week. And, but more recently, under the combined pressure of both of my wife, who has a slightly more advanced musical taste than me, and our son, who is actually writing music, I'll come to that later, we are sometimes now more often in, in a hall in London at the bottom right there called the Wigmore Hall, which is basically a recital hall, basically a chamber music hall, which has quite a lot of very, very difficult music, which we go and hear. So Bournemouth was, was the town where I first went to architecture school, where I can report where I to bring the pictures that we're doing the second building for the Arts University in Bournemouth. We did a blue one, which some of you may know. We are now just on site with an orange one. And the earlier version of that institution, before it was a university, was where they had a tiny, tiny architecture school with about 30 people in it, where we were taught to work from neoclassical patterns. We had to measure churches with pieces of lead. We had to draw all the five orders of architecture by using proportion, not measurement. We had to then use and look at and repeat Victorian ornamental uh, details and so on. Bear in mind, and, and I went there at 16, bear in mind that actually I'd been reading Le Cabousier in the local library. I knew who Gunnar Asplund was before I went to this funny school. So it's very weird. So I was a modernist, having done the old castles and cathedrals earlier. I was a modernist before I went to the architect's school, and then we had to do all this stuff. I'm not sure whether that was good, bad, or sideways. The thing that I have to say about Bournemouth is, on the one hand, it is a seaside resort. Nowadays, it is, a, it's a, it is full of students. It's full of many colleges. There are 40,000 students in that city. And the highest number of discotheques in, in England. But, in fact, it is a repository, because it was very prosperous in the 19th century, of British neo-Gothic. And somehow or other, that British neo-Gothic was what actually sunk in from the Bournemouth years. I didn't go on the beach very much. I used to sell ice cream on the beach, but I didn't like it. Uh, but it's also full of very spooky things in amongst trees. And then you arrive in London. And I went to the famous Architectural Association, and I was taught by two of the people... Oh, oops, I don't want it to do that. I want it to point. Does it point? No, it doesn't point. There's a guy on the top. This one, red one. Ah, oh, okay. That guy, Peter Smithson and his wife Alison, he was our fifth year, he was my fifth year tutor. And this man, James Gowan, with James Sterling, who did that building, was my fourth year tutor. And when I arrived in London, all these people I'd been reading about, it was wonderful as a provincial to suddenly arrive, and I saw Peter Smithson going up towards the toilet. I thought, I've arrived, I'm here, I'm really at the centre of things. And I was a great admirer of people like Eduardo Pahopsi, but a very weird thing happened. The second, time, second day I was at the AA, somebody said, oh, Pahopsi's talking. So I went down into a room 
which only had an audience of about eight people. This guy that I'd been looking at in, in newspapers and magazines had arrived. But in fact, the smart young things in London at that time were going to li listen to lectures about that. That would bring in 300 people, and Eduardo Palazzi would bring in eight people. And I was shocked. As an already, what, provincial modernist, I was shocked that the smarty pants, very correct sort of London types, were, were, were harking back. I mean, it's Brexit before Brexit. <laughs> and then came Archigram, which was a marvelous collection of people, some of whom had worked on these buildings, and the three of us who were younger, who hadn't worked on any buildings, were straight out of school. And I think one of the strengths of Archigram was that none of us came from the same school, none of us had the same taste in food, women, what you did in the evening, music. We were very, very different. Um, but we were allies. We were rivals and allies. And I think the structure of that is very interesting. Rather like you have in, in a good class in a college where your friend is also the person you're competing with. But this is not an archigram lecture. Um, what am I doing now? The English provincial, though, is supposed to come from the countryside. And I'm a funny person. I don't like the country. I'm a, a total wimp, for those who know what that word means. I don't ride a bicycle. I don't drive a car. I don't do mountains. I don't do islands. I don't really like the beach. Uh, but I like lots of other things. <laughs> I still get by. And the countryside, this is, this is a, a picture I insisted on my wife driving through a village the other day because I like the name. Oops, got this fucking thing. Uh, I, like, I like the name. Steeple Bumstead. Steeple Bumstead. <laughs> it's completely ridiculous. Bumstead reminds something of a bum or something. I mean, it's complete. I, I just, I said, we've got to take a deep. We took about a 15 kilometer detour. I said, why are we going through here? I said, I just want to photograph the sign as we come into it. But the English countryside, I have, I mean, it's very comfortable. It's very pleasant. It doesn't do any of the things I don't like, like have mountains and stuff and islands. It's just sort of rolled rather boringly, perhaps. But, but it's sort of picturesque. And that, I realize, is a characteristic that you have to watch with English design, with English architects. They're either being very pious, very worthy, or they're being picturesque. It's a great failing of English architecture. I even find myself playing the picturesque sometimes and sort of draw back from it. You know, so you see this nice village and it's all very sweetie, sweetie, sweetie. And of course, uh, one village is never very far from another village, so it's all right, it's fairly safe, you know. Um, even though the countryside is a bit spooky and smelly, and I don't go there very often, but nonetheless, one has to bear in mind that it's then sometimes even in one's work, one slightly parodies it, one slightly imitates this picturesque, gentle, tree-like tree thing. But another very, I think, very key instinct is the instinct that comes from, again, from the Second World War through cartoonists such as this guy, William Heath Robinson, who invented ridiculous arrangements of apparatus that actually could almost work at a moment about at which you're about to poke fun at them, you realize they're actually, they're quite clever, they're quite interesting. And I think that somebody must write a PhD thesis on the relationship between the work of Heath Robinson and the British high-tech movement. I mean, it's definitely there. I remember people who would spend a whole weekend mending a car with bits of wire and string for it to break down about one hour after it had been mended. And there's this sort of thing where Again, it goes back to the Second World War, if I dare. Uh, my late friend Warren Chalk did a whole piece of an archigram about the mysterious period that we never talk about creatively, which is the 40s, the period of the Second World War, and, and the entrails of modernism, and then the inventions and the, the developments that were made 
in structure, in using glues as structure, in using bits and pieces. And the, the most famous, which I know uh, many other architects are, have been interested in, which is the lamella construction of the Wellington bomber, which was done by a man called Barnes Wallace, who also invented the bouncing bomb. Uh, and I know that people like Jesse Reiser in, in New York have written about this a lot. And the Wellington bomb was a marvelous thing because you could shoot at it, make a great hole in it, and the thing would just continue to fly along, which I love. You see, I think the silly part of me enjoys the fact of making an aeroplane that you can shoot a hole in, and it just carries on regardless. I, the, the irony of these things, you know, the irony of, 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 of his cartoons also, uh, not only is it imperfect, even my caption is imperfect. The, the delight doesn't exist. It's me forgetting to obliterate the V. But I like imp imperfection. This is Porto. Porto is one of my favorite. As you travel, you go and see things that are, uh, intrigue you and amuse you, because the rest is like it's like. Um, I remember going to Chicago the first time and standing in front of a Mies van der Rohe building of the American kind, which I found extremely tedious, but I had to have myself like a selfie, you know, photographed in front of it. I still didn't find it any more interesting, but I ticked tick the box and been there. But I digress, because I think the, the cities like Porto are so ridiculous. They're full of absurdity. Here's a tunnel going, a, a road that's almost impossible, a building that appears to be sitting on graffiti or posters, but that the architecture changes not only every building, but even within a building. A, a Porto, I, I never, I've been three or four times, I never, it's much more interesting than Lisbon, much more interesting than Barcelona, because it's so stupid. There's marvellous roads that end nowhere, bridges that one on top of the other as if they can't quite decide at which level to cross the river. It's full of ridiculous, ridiculous ones. Now, another thing, as you take yourself with you, there's a certain, I'm not as political as you are, but there's certain things that really strike you. In Mexico City, near to the Candela, wonderful concrete piece, there's a guy selling quite sure what he's selling, some, something that you could eat. And it's the most ramshackle, sorry, it's the most complicated, ridiculous, ramshackle is the only word I can think of, crazy kind of almost hanging on its eyebrows structure. But he has cemented it, if you look carefully, he's cemented it into the ground. Here's this thing that will probably collapse in a high wind, but no, he wants, to, he wants it to be there. And I think that the more one travels, the more you see the irony of life. Now, one of the things I really like doing is eating. Uh, I'm on a diet at the moment, but I, I really do like eating. And I like to use restaurants as a place where I really relax and start not only having good conversations with people. I'm a great lover of, of a, the almost dead tradition in England of the long lunch. The long lunch is a marvelous invention, dying. It's even dying in this country, I know. But there are wonderful, so you go to, this is just a, a, a brasserie in, not in Paris actually, but in Lyon. And a subtle difference, it almost looks like La Coupole, but it's not. And a subtle difference between a Lyonnaise brasserie and a Paris brasserie. The way the people eat, the sort of, the, the, the dishes, ostensibly the same, but the conversation is different, the nuance is different, and the amount of rum that you can put on the rum bar bar is much greater. And then, you know, fish and chips. This is a slide I took uh, only a week ago. I happened to be in a... I have a lot of trouble with this. Uh, I happened to be there a week ago, and I read up on the... I had to be in this funny town. And I read up which was the best fish and chip shop in town, of which there are 50. And I tramped <laughs> to have my fish and chips and check it out. Uh, on the other hand, the very best fish I've had recently in England is here, which is a 150-year-old oyster place in Whitstable, which is where the best oysters come from in, in the UK. But a restaurant that we often go to, which is full of architects, is a pub called the Eagle. <laughs> 
And in this pub, the, 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 the owner of the pub encourages all this sort of design scene to come and eat there, and the food is really, really good. But the furniture collapses. He has the worst, oldest, crappiest furniture that you can think of. But he himself has a collection of modernist furniture. Mm. <laughs> and I think that uh, restaurants are a marvelous institution for relax. The other thing that I collect, and this is a post-rationalization of just something, I don't know why I got a few years, maybe 15 years ago, I started collecting pictures of kiosks. My wife comes from Tel Aviv, which has 460 kiosks, and, and probably supplies the highest number that I have collected on. I love the fact that the kiosk here is a modernist invention from, the from Germany from the 1920s. The, you have the boulevard, the kiosk at the end, the ladies walking dogs down the boulevard, and then the hoi polloi buying things in the kiosk. Here is a, an authentic German kiosk from Frankfurt, very miserable, with a very sad Turkish guy in there who just about sells you a bottle of wine if, you, if you're nice to him. On the other hand, troubled Israel, with all its troubles and discussion, a fantastically cheerful kiosk. It's always busy. It's there. It's, it's got a queue at one o'clock in the morning. The guy has the perfect fruit. Tragedy, though, is around the corner because another guy runs another kiosk which has miserable fruit. He's only a block away from the first guy. <laughs> and he has to put pictures of, of, of good fruit on the wall <laughs> because it fools nobody. So he then ends up selling ballpoint pens and old alarm clocks. I mean, tragedy, if you look at these things that aren't proper architecture, they tell you about the city. And I only wish that our architecture could have as much spirit as the kiosk. The kiosk doesn't notice. On the other hand, there is the sort of kiosk that is interesting for, dare I say, intellectual reasons. When I think of Michael Webb's Cushicle, I think of Mr. Coffee. he's so frothy because he does all the things in a way that the Kushikul did. It comes along, it opens out, it functions, it has a whole apparatus that, that is folding and moving. But it's not a smarty pants, wonderful microwave Kushikul. It's Mr. Frothy, so coffee, so frothy. Uh, and you can't ignore one's design education. So, of course, I'm of the generation that loves the Airstream. I'm of the generation that the other day in Santa Monica notices that the Santa Monica bus company does have rather well-designed kiosks. It's called bus shelters. And then I like, in, in my pursuit of kiosks, you find yourself in funny situations. I, as one is, happened to be passing through Valparaiso, Chile, and I took a slide of a kiosk, and the guy inside, you can see the guy inside, he noticed that I was doing this. A rather bad slide, but he then brings his dog up from inside to look as if the dog is operating the kiosk. Now, for some instinctive reason, I immediately email this to my friend Tom Hennigan in Tokyo, who, of course, sent, because it's Japan, sends me a much better dog running a much better kiosk. Uh, and so we start a correspondence on the subject, not only of kiosks, and then my wife happens to be in Beijing and immediately sends me a photograph of a cat on somebody's back. So we have dogs in kiosks and cats on backs, and, you know, if you add that to Peter Robinson, I think you've got a cultural situation or something. I like spooky, though. I mean, selective pieces of countryside are interesting. This is a, a wonderful, probably one of the best gardens in England by William Kent in, near Oxford. And I imagine very... Oops, sorry, I keep doing it. I, I imagine very spooky, nasty things. If a dead body was there, it, it would not come as any surprise. And there's another one there. This, this, this stream is trapped and then appears and here in Pasadena, California, many years ago, my students were photographing the green and green house across the street, which I'd already seen. But I was fascinated by this hedge. I wanted it to be a house. I wanted it to be spooky. I don't want somebody to tell me, no, it's just an ordinary hedge. 
I want to find things in a monk. So this sort of love-hate relationship I have with the countryside, I think is something to do with that. There are strange demons or instinctive fascinations which grip you sometimes. My two favorite cities other than the one I live in are Tokyo and Los Angeles, for which I could go into many detailed reasons. Um, one of the early times I went was when to, to Tokyo was when Ito's wonderful nomad bar. It was the most dreamy thing I'd ever been in. It's been long, am I running over? Uh, most dreamy things I'd ever been in. And of course, I love the tackiness and amusement and ridiculousness of Shibuya. We usually stay in Shibuya, but just around the corner where it's quiet. So we have it both ways. We have the quietness and then you burst out and it's all happening. I love that. Um, an odd thing, my son's girlfriend, who's Californian, mentioned the other day when she, we took her for the first time to Bournemouth. She said, it's just like Santa Monica. And I wonder about that. I wonder if it really is. It, you know, here's a bay with a lot of sand and some buildings in amongst trees. Wait a minute, where have we seen that before? <laughs> it's Bournemouth. I mean, there are differences, but the, the buses do run on time in Santa Monica and you can get fish and chips. Interesting one. And there are 50,000 British passport holders in that district. Something adds up and you take yourself with you I think the Palm House in Kew is the best building in London. That's what I always ask when the tourists say, what's the best building in life? Palm House in Kew, there's no question. Wonderful. And I like it because it's blobby. Now, were I have to be, were, had I been sensible and brought a few slides of my own work, I would have been able to show that the Kunsthaus in Graz is in the great tradition of the blob, whether it's Mr. Blobby, or whether it's the palm house, or whether it is things associated with blobbing and squirting. And I always say in describing how we arrived at the plan form of the, of the Graz building was that we simply looked at what site was available and went <laughs> and it filled up the site. Very simple system. Uh, and of course, I couldn't resist having got to tomatoes uh, to include fish and chips with tomato sauce. Um, I have spent a lot of time, statistically 50 years and something like 15,000 students directly taught, or some horrible statistic, in academe. I'm very cynical about academe. I'm very irritated as this cartoon, these cartoons were done for the competition when we did the Australian uh, architecture school, which we won, so the cartoons didn't put the jury off. But without the building, it, one can say that I'm irritated by smarty pants critics who sit there, and very, usually young, dare I say it, who, want, who are more interested in showing how clever they are than actually taking any interest in what the student is doing. And they terrify, of course, here are some of the, this girl's friends Absolutely petrified. Um, this is also about over-intellectualized seminars. Here is a guy, and somebody took a photograph of me in the final building with my arms in exactly the same position as the guy. But here he is with an old, older student in the front row who's probably mortgaged his house in order to go and do a PhD thinking, what the fuck am I doing? This rubbish being pushed at me. I'm very cynical about academe. I've always regarded myself as a sort of joke academic. The fact that I have three or four professorships suggests that probably I'm not. But I still prefer to think of myself as a joke academic. And finally, the people closest to me, I'm delighted to say that I, I fell in, and actually, Benedetta will remember, I took Yael on her first date when she was sharing a place with you in Salzburg, right? 
Anyway, the first date related, uh, re re resulted in that. And I'm delighted to say that many years later, she made an intervention in your city, down the street from here somewhere, Plaza del, whatever it is. And, um, well, they're all something, aren't they? Uh, and our son is in the music business. He, for those of you who watch these things, some of you may have heard of him. He's A.G. Cook of PC Music. And uh, sometimes architects go to his concerts. And he, it's interesting that he, a very late child, statistically, brace yourself, 97 years younger than my father. So like two and a half generations or more got lost somewhere in the, or didn't happen. Anyway, by the way, when he gives us his sort of schedule of what he's doing over the next two, three, four months, it reads very much like the early days of Archigram. Going here, going to this city, unpacking, doing a gig, going somewhere, knowing a network of people, as, as the late Rainer Bannam used to say, known to 235 people, famous to 235 people throughout the world. I think his is slightly more, but it's very interesting, the parallels between a music scene and an architecture scene. And this, this lady who I fell for because I fancied her ends up behaving much more as an intellectual than I ever gathered. So I'm kept, I'm kept very much alive by being topped and tailed by these two people who are, in a sense, like the old archigram group, lovers and rivals. I think that's it.